While you're standing, would you please just join us in prayer as we invoke the presence of the Lord here this afternoon. Father, we are gathered here this afternoon Lord, to commemorate the life, celebrate the life of our dearly beloved brother. Father, we pray for your presence that is promised to walk with us through life's darkest valleys. Saturate the house today with your grace and your glory. Touch this family today. Let them feel your closeness. Lord, and again, we ask you that our words would be acceptable in your sight and worthy of the life that we are gathered to commemorate. We ask it in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Carlos McKinley McLaughlin Jr., age 74, of Rutgersville, Virginia, passed away on Wednesday, September 8, 2021, at his home. He was born on October 11, 1946, to the late Carlos McKinley McLaughlin Sr. and a Rebecca Louise Keene McLaughlin. He was also pre preceded in death by two sisters, Peggy Schlow and Sylvia Taylor. He is survived by his wife, Cindy Lou McLaughlin, sons Carlos McLaughlin III and wife, Patty, Wesley McLaughlin and wife, Cindy, Brian McLaughlin and Ann Kaufman, and Neil McLaughlin and his wife, Julie, brother, Wayne McLaughlin, sisters, Kathy Smith, Linda Smith, Joe Mills, Betty Marcus, Wanda Dawson, Sue Dean, and Sharon Dean. Grandchildren, Chastity Reese, Clayton McLaughlin, Nathan McLaughlin, Casey Dowell, Brandon McLaughlin, Destiny McLaughlin, Taylor McLaughlin, Michaela McLaughlin, and Levi McLaughlin, and great-grandchildren, Michael McLaughlin, Kylie Dowell, Annabelle Hitt, Jace McLaughlin, Waylon Dowell, Silas Dowell, Adeline McLaughlin, Lively Sloan, Weston McLaughlin, August Reese, uh, Bowen Dowell, and Leonis Reese. That's a wonderful legacy to be able to look at and to be able to call these to member of the family. I was also asked if I would read this <coughs> written by Carlos's brother, Wayne. Let me share this with you. He says, my brother was not a college graduate, but could put many engineers to shame. Designed a solo helicopter, self-feeding wood stove, and a design for gutter covers long before they were popular. Always an entrepreneur, landlord, and energy conservationist. Always working out a new idea to save energy, fuel, ahead of his time. Jack of all trades, from carpenter, mechanic, hunter, auto body man, even tried a snack shack, a s truck, excuse me, <laughs> on a job site. Helped all his kin folks in the time of need, going to be sorely missed. He bought me my first BB gun. <coughs> Painted my 66 Nova candy apple blue. Helped him when he built a couple of homes. Of course, what pranks he didn't think of, I did. <laughs> I remember some of those stories, but time won't allow it here. He was always a hard worker, providing for his boys. Was in his wedding in 1982 when he married his sweetheart, Cindy. She cared for him like no other. We would trade stories and jokes around the dinner table for hours. He was 10 years older than me, and we became closer when I grew up. Too many stories to tell. Anytime Dad had a problem with the car or at work, he'd call Carlos and he would take care of it. Made me relieved when I was stationed far away. 
our last work at 6632 Cedar Springs was pruning the trees front and back. I'll never forget what a wonderful brother he was. I was also asked to share some things, so here goes. I first met Carlos when he was probably about age 16. I was singing in the Southeastern Choir, and we had a one-night stand up at camp. Peggy and her dad came, and first time I met her dad, we'd been dating for probably about a year and a half, and that was the first time I had met him, so needless to say, there was a little apprehension on my part when that took place. However, that was relieved right away. And we hopped in the car from camp and went down, spent the night down at their house. Got down the road just a little ways, and I don't know whether Brother Ken was really all that tired or just wanted to see what I could do, but he said, you drive. <laughs> okay, so I drove, and we, we got there. Between our junior and senior year, I believe it was, of college, Peggy was taking a Spanish course working in D.C. and was living with her sister and brother. Was that in Seven Corners? I believe it was, yeah. Well, in that time frame of that segment there, Carlos had bought a 58 Chevy, two-door, painted it up, had it red, and uh, back in that day, right behind the wheel well, between the wheel well and the door, there was that little panel, and Carlos had painted with shoe polish Mr. 348. <laughs> now that was the thing back in that day. Trying to show what muscle you had under the hood. So I asked him if I could borrow his car that night to go down to Seven Corners. He said, sure. And I didn't think about it too much until coming home and traffic light caught me and there was a guy pulled up beside me in his car and he started revving the engine. I thought, okay, this could be interesting. I'm in a barred car, Florida driver's license, Virginia plates, what do I do? So I slipped it in low gear, and I don't remember now whether it was a floor stick or column stick, but anyhow, I eased it in first gear. I never revved the engine up to uh, egg him on, but he kept. So as soon as that light turned green, I trumped it and was across that intersection before he could blink. About two blocks later, the light caught me again, and this guy just snuck up right beside me. Nothing else went on the rest of that little trip coming out of Seven Corners, but it was uh, still interesting. Moved down a couple of years later, and I think it was that, about that time that he bought his Harley. And we had driven it around a while, and he said, uh, I need to go to Woodbridge to buy some oil, it's time to change the brake in oil, hop on. <sighs> uh huh. It wasn't the kind of roads going to Woodbridge that you've got now. It was those nice little two lanes where you lean this way and you lean, and he throttled it for all it was worth. But it was still fun for the ride uh, to do that. A few days later, I watched him as he left for Texas. He was going to go and get a job in the oil fields, 18 years old now. And I see him strike off down the road. I was up on the roof doing something at the house, and I could see him going down 29 South. Everybody in the house was very solemn, very, you know, what's going to happen. Didn't hear from him for several days. And finally, he got a phone call from him. He was in Louisiana. He'd made it that far. He did go on to the... Texas oil fields and they weren't hiring. So he washed his bike, turned around and headed home. And he got homesick too. That was another as aspect to that. He got a little homesick. And uh, it wasn't long before he was back home and everybody was happy. A few years later he bought a truck, red truck, painted it up, fixed it up, put a ooga horn on it. And Jimmy and I were with him one day, and I believe it was down around the uh, traffic circle in Fairfax. And I don't know what we were going to check on, but there was three of us in the vehicle. And 
we came around one side of the circle and there was a man there that had lifted a manhole cover, had a pickaxe, lifted the manhole cover, had it sitting about crossways of the manhole cover, and you can imagine what Carlos did when he got up beside that guy. He laid on that horn, hoo You saw hands fly up, lid slammed. We turned around and looked as we got on around the corner and this man had his hands raised, but he wasn't praising the Lord, I'm sure. <laughs> But needless to say, he was a guy that had uh, enjoyed a lot of fun. 75, we left for the Bahamas. Three boys, suitcases, cardboard boxes packed with stuff. And we asked Carlos if he could take us to the airport. He did, that red truck. Three boys in the back and all the stuff. And I imagine when we got to the airport, and that was national at that time, it wasn't Reagan, it was national. I would imagine there was a lot of people looking and saying, here come the clampets, or they're scaled down a little bit. <laughs> but uh, he was generous and took us and we had a, lot of, uh, had a lot of laughs. One last thing I'll share. He was also a man of faith. Make no doubt about it, he was a man of faith. I remember when he was cleaning the property off up on the mountain where, I, at the base of the mountain where I live now, he was up into the mountain and built, was building a house, cleared the lot, had poured gas around the perimeter of the uh, pile and was going to ignite it. I don't guess he was really thinking too much about the direction that the wind was blowing. And so, uh, and this wasn't a fault, it is just one of those things you don't necessarily think about. You don't do that kind of work all the time. When he flipped the match toward that pile, everything blew back on him. And it just burned. I mean, his face, arms, he was just a mess. He hopped in his truck from up at Bull Run Mountain and drove the distance between there to Centerville, where his parents lived. Just, he said, I could hardly sit still in the seat. It hurt so bad. But I got to Dad's. They took him to the hospital. The doctors had uh, looked him over and said, we need to keep you overnight. And he said, no, you're not going to keep me overnight. And they begged him to stay. He wasn't, he wasn't hearing any of that. The church was in revival, and he knew they would be praying. They were going to be having revival service that night. So he said, no. He said, I want to go home. Church will be praying. He went home and was in misery the rest of the afternoon. In the evening, Around about 8 o'clock, he said he just totally dropped right off to sleep. Just boom, like somebody had given him a sedative. Sound asleep. When the rest of the family came home, they asked how he was doing. He said, I'm fine. No pain. And he said, what time were you praying for me? And they said it was a little after 8 o'clock. God answered prayer. Healed him. Three weeks later, there was a church picnic. He was there sitting out in, the, in a lawn chair, and I was, as I was looking at him, you could already see the new skin growing in, and he never had a scar. Never had any scars from that. Don't tell me God doesn't care. Hallelujah, he does.
Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm glad that uh, Brother Jerry opened up the door for me. Amen. Because I got a lot of stories to tell, too. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I could tell them on all of you brother-in-laws, but uh, Carlos, he had quite a... Uh, what an impact. Amen. Praise God. Uh, but I do have a passage of scripture this morning. Uh, I want this, this afternoon, I want to say, the Lord gave me this. I, 1980, I was preaching a revival at Bible Holiness in Neosho, Missouri. It was my first revival. And uh, uh, I'd preached one night, give the altar call. It was a praying church. Uh, in that revival, I think ten people got saved, uh, and but I, I, you know, not to my credit, to the fact that the church was praying, Amen. And uh, I I preached, uh, gave the altar call, there was response, and uh, I was standing here just like this, getting ready to turn and go back and kneel at the uh, bench, and the Spirit of God spoke to me. Uh, of scripture and the thing is uh, uh, he didn't give me the scripture he gave me the reference amen he said tomorrow night you're preaching out of Matthew chapter 5 verse 4 and I, 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 to my regret brother Brand, I have to say I, I didn't know what that said amen I didn't have that memorized Amen, that Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Praise God. And so as I went to my knees and began, to, uh, I first uh, just opened my Bible up and looked it up. And for all the next day, I began to look into that passage of Scripture. Now, I'm not going to preach that message to you today that's, uh, but I do want to let you know that uh, the Spirit of God spoke to me just day before yesterday, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, for today. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Praise God. Uh, you know, there's another passage in the book of Psalms that says that, uh, you know, weeping will endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Praise God. And... Uh, I know uh, Cindy, Carl, Wesley, Neil, y'all boys, uh, and you, Cindy, are going to have some rough days, I can tell you by experience. That there's rough days that are ahead. There will be dark days. There will be days of your mind will be flooded with memories, precious memories. Praise God. That's why somebody wrote the song. You know, precious memories, how they linger. Praise God. And uh, But <clears throat> I want to tell you that the Word of God is true. I found it out in 1979. I stood by my grandmother's bedside and held her hand while she changed worlds. 1990, I stood by the bedside of my mama, and she changed worlds. 20, 21. I stood by my wife while she changed worlds. But I can tell you that there's a person who Jesus promised would be here for you. Amen. He said, I must go away that he can come. Praise God. Uh, Jesus in the flesh was limited by time and space. But I can tell you the Holy Ghost has no limits. He's got power. Praise God. And I, I want to encourage you all. You know, I would be remiss if I stood here this, this afternoon and didn't talk to you about the legacy that you have from Carlos, from Brother Ken, from Sister Anna, uh, all the years and all the things. Amen. Praise God. And of course, we've heard the stories now, you know, and Carlos was a great storyteller, just like his dad. He inherited that from Brother Ken. And I, I don't know how many times, I mean, every dinner, every dinner you spent, you know, about half of it 
eating and the other half listening. Praise God. As we would spend that time, and I heard a lot of those stories over and over again. Praise God. And I know, uh, I'm like uh, Apostle Paul said in the book of Hebrews, time won't permit me to tell you all that I do, do know. Praise God. But I, I do want to share one or two with you. Glory to God. Uh, and, uh, of course, like I said, Brother McLaughlin, he was, he was quite the storyteller. Amen. And so Carlos had that quality. But uh, I'll tell you some that, I, not that he told me, but, amen, but that I was in. I was involved in it, praise God, like Jerry here, praise God. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, he was my first landlord. Somebody mentioned landlord already. He was a landlord. He was my first landlord and my only landlord, just like Brother McLaughlin was my first father-in-law and my only father-in-law, praise God. And uh, uh, glory to God. But uh, I, I, you could call on Carlos to help you, praise God. And uh, he had a pickup truck, and a man at my job had given me a piano. Uh, you know, and we were young and strong, probably more stupid than strong, but anyway, we went on, just him and I went one night to Round Hill, Virginia, to get that piano. And uh, I thought me and him and the guy that lived there that gave me the piano, we could carry that thing out of there. But I think Bobby and Jimmy and some of the, and the, we ended up about six or eight of us went up there to get it when it finally come. Carlos and I looked at that thing. We pulled on one end. We couldn't even get it going. You know, it was a big square grand piano with a, the middle of it was cast iron, you know. <laughs> but I'll never forget the ride home that night. It was in that Chevy pickup truck he had, and we were coming down that Broad Run Church Road. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, it's a crooked road, narrow, still that way, come from uh, Hamilton over to uh, Oatlands. And Carlos was going around there, and we were going, and he'd slide around them on a hardtop road. I mean, the tires was crying. I was begging, please, Carl. Carl, slow this thing down. We're in no hurry to get home, Carl. Hey, yeah. He looked over at me with a big old grin and said, Ken, I'm gonna make you homesick. <laughs> and I was, praise God. <laughs> Glory to God. I won't tell you, you know, I'll let Carlos Jr. there I, I call him Carlos Jr. This is Carlos Jr., but that's Carl Jr. to me. Praise God. And uh, I'll let Carl Jr. tell you about the time they became G-men. I think they were going to be G-men. Anyway, they was going to raid this uh, marijuana patch, or supposedly marijuana patch, <laughs> that was out in the woods and took some people out there and put on a charade, you know, and scared an old boy to death till he was, <laughs> amen. Praise God. Or I'll let Wayne maybe. I'll tell you about when Carlos cast him as an axe murderer. <laughs> Put him on the wood pile with that axe splitting wood and told, told some of the neighbor boys, said, he's killed a bunch of people. <laughs> he just got out of prison. <laughs> Carlos loved to laugh. Absolutely. Amen. Uh, praise God. You know, and if... Uh, I don't know if everybody that <laughs> was a part of his jokes got a laugh out of it. I don't know <laughs> when them black snakes comes crawling through McDonald's and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't want to be sacrilegious or anything, but that was Carlos McLaughlin. That was my brother-in-law and my friend. <laughs> through life, you know, through many difficulties. He didn't have it easy. I remember we was pouring concrete and where he built that apartment up there off of uh, Rogues Road. And old brother John Beach was in there. And it was hot. It was about 100 degrees that day. And if you ever pour any concrete, you know it puts off heat. So it was probably 110 in there or better inside that building. We were trying to smooth that stuff out and it was going away from us. And Praise God, I remember old Brother Beach, and he, he loved Carlos. He had sold him that lot to build on. Old Brother Beach was an old-time country Pentecostal preacher. And he was in there, and, and, and a pair of them there snapped galoshes, you know, boots. He was in that concrete in there and got to talking about God. 
and about to, and, and the Holy Ghost come on him and he got to speaking in tongues right there. Amen. While we were trying to flatten that concrete out. Glory to God. But God helped us get through it. And, uh, back to my scripture. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word that is translated comforted here is exactly the same word that Jesus used when he said the Holy Ghost would come. What I want to encourage you, family, let the Holy Ghost speak to you. Let him comfort you and let him help you. Heaven's real. It's ours for the asking. All you've got to do is pray. Salvation is a prayer away. Eternal life is within, with, it's within our grasp. We can have it. Praise God. Appreciate these brothers done so well. And, and I think it's exactly right for their laughter at a memorial service for Carlos McLaughlin. I don't think he would have been happy if we got in here and, and there wasn't some, some humor. So we move into this uh, celebration of, of his life, and that's what it is. Uh, Sister Cindy had, had requested some songs. Brother Carlos loved to hear the choir sing. He, he just loved the choir here. And uh, Sister Cindy had requested that the choir sing a couple songs in honor of Brother Carlos this afternoon. And... Uh, as the darkness of that disease settled over him, there'd be nights that I didn't even know if he knew where he was or not. You know, just come in, and I felt so sorry. Sister Cindy would, would get him in and sit down, and, and he, you could just see it. But then all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord began to move into service. And night after night after night, I look back. Nobody else is moving yet. Brother Carlos would have both hands in the air. He was home. He, he knew that spirit. So the choir's coming to sing. Come on, choir. And, and we're going to be respectful, but I think it would, would, would make Brother Carlos proud if you worship the same Lord that he worshiped all these years. So as the choir sings, just enter into that spirit of worship with them and let that comforter come into the house this evening. When the choir came in this morning, the musicians came in and Brother Kevin and Sister Whitney came in. Neither one of them could hardly talk. So, Lord, you're going to, have to help us right here. Just two of our main singers, and they can't talk. So, with a lot of prayer and a bag full of, of uh, throat lozenges, choir started showing up. They can't talk. And I want to tell you, Sister Cindy, I've, I've been here eight years. If I had asked them to sing, I'd have got all one of these numbers. I, I can't. My, my throat. But Sister Cindy asked them to sing. So they said, pass out the cough drops. We're going to sing. Worship with them today.
but neither if you're no more rich than me. Oh, but if your eyes can look beyond what man is building, you will see what earthly mortals they cannot see. For on the other side of Jordan, there's construction going on. There's a mansion being built for you and me. Upon foundations, oh, that are man-made and will someday pass away. Oh, it won't be built where the storms of life can batter, and where the clouds often hide the light of day. Oh, but the cornerstone of God is my foundation, the root of David, Christ the Lord, my coming King. Oh, what a great! Homecoming there awaits me. Oh, yes, I expect any day to move right in.
choir. When I received the news of Brother Carlos's passing on that Wednesday afternoon as he made his way through the veil of tears and into that celestial home we've been singing about, along with my prayers for the family, I immediately began asking God for direction for this moment. I asked the Lord for something unique, not just to be different, but because Carlos was different. He was a character in every sense of the word. And, and there's so many comforting texts and what Brother Taylor's already shared with us. And, and, I, and I looked through, through all of those and I just poured over. And I appreciated the comfort for all of those promises in the Word. But I don't know what works for everybody else, but I, I'm, a, I'm a mountain boy. I got to do what works for me. I, 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 don't, I, I don't work well in an office most of the time. I said, I, I just got to take a walk. I got to get in the woods. And I walk in praying, and in the course of the stillness of that walk, I felt the Lord speak a name to my heart. And that name was the name Onesiphorus. I said, yeah, Lord, that's pretty unique. I knew a little bit about that. I thought I knew. I knew I'd read that in the biblical record. But I made my way back there to the office Friday morning. And when I opened up, and, and, and I had to reference it, Brother Taylor, I, I didn't have it memorized either. But when I began to read that, the tears flooded my eyes. I, I think I found my man. So I want to share this with you today. It's very unique uh, in, in a memorial service. But again, we're talking about a very unique individual today. Second Timothy Chapter number 1, and verse number 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. Listen to this. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome... He sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. This man, O Nesiphorus, was, he, he's not a very notable man. He, he doesn't uh, make his way into the acts of the apostles at all. He was a simple man with a simple faith. In fact, other than here in a couple passages in 2 Timothy, we, we never read of his name. Most of the world, and even the Christian world, would never meet this man. They, they would never understand the importance of his ministry. But to the Apostle Paul, who was arguably the greatest Christian who ever lived, the most influential Christian of all time, the, the heart and soul, the words, the witness, and the work of this man Onesiphorus were invaluable. He oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. And friends and family, the same could be said about Carlos McLaughlin today. Most of the world never knew him. As far as I know, he never preached a sermon. Now you boys may disagree. I'm sure, I'm sure he preached some sermons to y'all over the years. But those of us that were blessed to be inside his inner circle, he was a minister. Not in a pulpit, but his life was a ministry. The world didn't mean anything to him, nor he to them. But for those that knew and loved him, and you couldn't know him and not love him, he meant the world to us. So with your permission here in just a few minutes this afternoon, I'd like to look at this man in, in our text and use his story to honor Brother Carlos today. I, I want you to notice, first of all, that like Onesiphorus, Carlos McLaughlin had a ministry of refreshment. He oft refreshed me. Does that describe Carlos or not? 
How many here today have been refreshed by his character, his conduct, and yes, his comedy? If, as the Bible says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, then I think it's safe to say that Carlos McLaughlin was a medicine man. His was a ministry of mirth. His goal in life was to make you smile. His utmost desire was for you to be happy. He was never happier than when you were happy. I, I, I've told the family several times over the last few days, these brothers have shared some of them, but there's some of those stories, I think he told them so long that he started believing them. <laughs> but it's been said that the best way to judge a man's true character is watch children and how children react to him. And if that's the judge of character, there's, I've never met a man quite like Carlos McLaughlin. Brother Sean told me if, if we could give out a bus a rider award for the bus ministry, it, it would have went hands down to Brother Carlos. We've been here eight years, and from the beginning, he was the church grandpa. Kids, like his master, kids sat up on his knees, and he taught them, and some of it was good. But, but look again at the text. Not only was his a ministry of refreshment, it was also a ministry to the reproached. Paul said, Onesiphorus is important to me because he refreshed me. And he wasn't ashamed of my chains. To appreciate that, you have to understand that Paul was not a popular preacher at this time. Matter of fact, he'd been in prison for some time. And if you'll read the verses just before the, the ones that, that we've read today, you'll find out that people were walking away from him by the droves. That, that good friends were turning their backs on him because now he's a prisoner. He's a political prisoner. But Onesiphorus was walking in when others were walking out. He oft refreshed me. He's not ashamed of my chain. And once again, it so beautifully illustrates the giving heart, the loving legacy of Brother Carlos today. He wasn't afraid to touch the untouchable. And he wasn't ashamed for you to know that he was doing it. Paul said when he was in Rome of Onesiphorus, he sought me out very diligently. He looked for me. He went in when others went out. And that's the way Brother Carlos was. How many times have I heard it over the last eight years? And especially these last few days. I, I, preachers, I don't eavesdrop. That's not polite. But sometimes if you'll stand quietly over by the side, and look at the flowers, or look at, you'll be amazed what you hear. And I've heard it time and time and time and time again. He was better to me than my own family. I, I know those of, of us that loved him, and I can only imagine what it's been in the past. We hurt because we saw him taken advantage of time and again. He threw that heart out there, and there were people who, who took, them, took him for the proverbial ride. But to Brother Carlos, it was worth the risk. And I can say to all of you today, and you know it, that even when he was disappointed in what we were doing, he wasn't disappointed in us. And even when we disappointed and betrayed the confidence he put in us, he wouldn't have done it any other way. And given the opportunity, he'd have went back in wholehearted again. He felt like we were worth the risk. And can I tell you today, he still does. Tasks like this are difficult today. Because it's, 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 it's so hard, there's that balance of saying enough and not saying too much. I mean, how in the world can you put 70, nearly 75 years of life, and especially the life of Brother Carlos, in, into 15 or 20 minutes in, in a memorial service? 
So I, I need to move on because there's, there's a couple other things I want to leave with you as we complete this memorial today. Like the man in our scripture text, Carlos had a ministry of refreshment. He had a ministry to the reproached. He went where nobody else would go. He would do what nobody else would do. But I want you to never forget that it is also a ministry that is even now being rewarded. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, Paul said. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. What day was he talking about? This day. A day of reckoning. The day of coming reckoning. The day when we give an account for this life. Brother Carlos lived by the motto which became one of his favorite sayings over the years. He, he was so often in life's difficulties. He, he, he loved to say there is nothing in life that hard work and prayer can't take care of. And friends and family today, I, I want to remind you that today, right now, while we mourn that hard work and all those prayers are being rewarded. The Hebrew writer said it like this in 6 and 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. God has not forgotten what Carlos McLaughlin did here. What he did here was an investment for over there. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of God. That's where Brother Carlos was at. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There will be a payday someday. I know that eight years ago when that dark cloud of dementia was diagnosed that, that many of you were, were filled with those questions. Why? Why him? Why somebody like him? And especially in these suffering days of late. Why Carlos? Can I be transparent with you today? Teresa and I have often asked the same question. Came here eight years ago, and immediately, Carlos and Teresa had a special connection. She said, he's just like a, a papa. We hadn't been here long at all. And he would come through, and he'd shake her hand, and he'd lean toward her. And she'd tell me when we'd go home, she said, I, I'm going to get a hug one of these days. So one of these days came. He said, honey, I reckon I'm old enough to be your daddy and maybe your papa. He said, it'd be all right. I'd hug you if your husband wasn't watching. So she turned around and said, just turn around for a minute. And from then on, it became the routine. Every time that he went out those doors, he'd wait to see, is he watching? And he'd give Teresa a hug. And she's not a church member. It's like losing another papa all over again. And we asked why. It's okay to ask. I've prayed. And I think I'm, I have the mind of the Lord. I don't think God is offended by us asking. He's not in any, under any obligation to tell us. But he's not offended when we ask. But here's what I want to remind us today. On Wednesday afternoon, when the final breath departed this earthly shell, and that eternal soul had winged its way to celestial glory, all the suffering finally made sense to Brother Carlos. Paul was a man who suffered greatly for the gospel. And he said it like this in Romans 18 and 8. He said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's a mathematical term. When Paul said, I reckon, he said, I've added it all up. And when I've added it all up, what I'm going through now is not worthy to be compared to what I'm going to get over there. 
And Paul said, you do the math. And I believe if we could ask Carlos today, was it worth it? I believe he would say much the same thing as well as I knew him. Let me see. Walls of jasper. Gates of pearl. Streets of gold. The presence of God. The singing of the angels. No more sickness. No more suffering. No more sorrow. No more darkness. No more dementia. No more death. You do the math. Boys, it's okay to ask questions. Cindy, it's okay to ask questions. But always check your math. That's what God had to tap on my shoulder and say, Preacher, check your math. What we're doing here is not worth to be compared to what we're going to over there. And that's what we're living for. Now, as they get, come back to the music and we come to the end of this moment, I, I want to leave us with a challenge today. Brother Carlos had a ministry of refreshment. He had a ministry to the reproached. He's had a ministry that's being rewarded right now. But friends and family, it's up to us to see that that's a ministry that's always remembered. The Lord grant unto him, in verse 18, that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. Listen to this. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. You know what he's done. We could pass the mic today and be here tomorrow talking about what he's done. And as the friends and family of Brother Carlos... Nobody knows that ministry better than us. But it's up to us to continue it. He lived the life. Now the legacy's up to us. He lived the life. The legacy is up to us. Father, thank you for everyone who's gathered here today. Thank you for the words that have been spoken. I think Brother Carlos would be pleased. Thank you for the songs. Thank you for this family, their unity, their togetherness. Thank you more so, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your witness that we felt here today. Lord, we are asking you now to, to wrap your arms around this family as we take a, another leg of this final journey. Will you be with us throughout the remainder of this day? Lord, will you make yourself real to us in ways that we've never comprehended before? Go with us. Keep your hands upon us, Lord. Watch over us. Protect us on our journey. In Christ's name, amen. I want to say on behalf of the family, thank you for being here today. Thank you for the food. Thank you for your fellowship. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the prayers. Thank you for the kindness. And, and once we're done with the committal service, the family will return here and they will receive friends at the fellowship hall. It's just over the hill behind the next building below this building. Uh, they've been working hard this morning to prepare a meal there for the family. And the family would like to invite you to join them in a time of fellowship and celebration, sharing memories, and just spending some time together. Everyone is welcome. And uh, we encourage you to come. Let's stand. The funeral directors are going to come now and they're going to dismiss you by row at the family's request. We're going to do this a little differently. Uh, Paul Bears, once you've been out with your family, will you slip back in this side door and come back over here and wait? The funeral directors are going to start here to my left. They're going to dismiss you by row. And Brother Carlos's children, Sister Cindy, and the grandchildren are going to stay in here. And please respect their privacy. And let's stay outside until they come out. God bless you today.